Well, in the astrology classes, I try to uh, teach that uh, in astrology, like everything else in life, coming to know something has three parts. One is observation, one is intuition, and one is putting the observations and intuitions together with good sound judgment. And so, when I observe from up here, my observation is is that the class is changing with such a small number that all it takes is two or three people to change and the composition is very greatly changed. And so my intuition was to discontinue the line that we were following. And uh, I thought about it and thought about it, and the conclusion that I came to is the talk, the two talks that would have followed what we did would have been very deep and very liberous. And they would have involved building on what had come before, building in such a way that you would want to have a more constant class. And so I have decided to discontinue them and move on to a different uh, uh, different little sub-series of talks. And this, is, this sub-series is about the life cycle. And the talk for this morning is where are the dead? If you want a fancy title, something that you can impress your friends with, you can say, you went to a talk called Modern Spiritual Eschatology. (laughs) (laughs) Eschatology means the science of death or a series of beliefs about deaths. And that is germane because most of us have not developed all the tools We're not all great seers so that we can investigate it and try it all for ourselves. So we have to rely to some extent upon the reports of people who have seen or who do see these things regularly and that have cross-checked each other just the way scientists in the material world do. So we're going to be looking at this as seen by seers from the Rosicrucian order as given to us in the Rosicrucian fellowship. We're doing this because it is a philosophy that is very clear, it is very explanatory, and it's really suited to um, our Western outlook. It's culturally appropriate for us. But before we launch into the technical material, it's probably good to be really clear about attitudes. We can't maximize the benefits of a study about death if we have fears of death or if we have dark attitudes about death. If we love something, we're drawn to it. And when, that's the way the law of attraction goes, if we love something, we're just drawn right to it. And when we love, we pay a lot of attention to what we love. So there's a commonly accepted notion about death that there's going to be a reckoning and that we're going to have to account for our deeds while we were alive. And to many, that is the very fearsome thing. A lot of people have a lot of things they feel guilty about. Now that commonly accepted notion has some truth to it, but the attitudes about that are not good. We live in a world of materialism, and in that materialistic world, we have a lot of illusions and misconceptions. And one of those misconceptions is that because the material world is opaque, we think we can hide things. With our conceit about our freedom, which is really a conceit because 
we are really much more slaves than we are free, we think we can get away with things. Or we think that we can defer them or put them off indefinitely. Moreover, in our selfishness and in our egoism, we prefer having pleasant things. We like to have things our own way. And even when some unpleasant things might be beneficial to us, we push them off. Now the reality is that we can learn to love things even that are unpleasant. Myself, I keep a very uh, strict diet. I can see the value to fresh vegetable juicing because you get all of the ethers, you get all of the enzymes, you get all the minerals that you need in the best form possible with fresh vegetable juice. And some of the best that you can get is pure green juice. Pure green juice is not a pleasant thing. <laughs> But I've gotten to love it. See, the thing is, when we're self-conscious, the way we are self-conscious, we can change. The green juice is going to change, and the things in the world aren't going to change easily, but we can change. Similarly, we can change our attitudes. If we put together the factors of avoiding unpleasant things and hiding behind illusions, we think that we can hide forever, that we're not going to have face-to-face -face things. We have a rather blight attitude about it, but there is one thing that is inevitable and invisible, and that is death. Somewhere along the line, our bodies are going to die. Now, even though we are lulled by our delusions, somewhere deep within that lulling is an intuition, a divine knowing, and it sees the truth whether we listen to it or not. The intuition knows that all the chickens are coming home to roost. So we have even an ambivalence sometimes about our intuition, which is the most wonderful thing that we ever experience in life. On one hand, we would like to be perpetually in intuition. We would like it to be our closest friend, so it's there all the time. On the other, the lower nature, which works beneath the surface of our consciousness and can pull strings that we're not even aware of, doesn't want to give up its dominion. It doesn't want to give up its control of things, and so it fights against uh, the intuitions when those intuitions are unpleasant or when they seem to be taking away the power of that lower nature. So most people build up a fear about death, or they have a sense of doom about death. At the same time that they're trying to get away with the most pleasure that they can get away with. And it is the lower thinking that makes the reality much worse than it is. There is a line in Shakespeare that uh, or something to the effect that there's nothing so bad in the world that thinking can't make it worse. <laughs> that uh, often it happens that way. So we have as much illusion about death as we have about life. One of the things that makes it difficult to approach the topic of death is uh, that all of the things we do boomerang on us and they put us in such a place 
that we can't appreciate death and the experience of death uh, because we've been protecting ourselves from that dark subject. I guess it's easy to be unafraid when you're smugly healthy and happy, but when you're challenged, it's surprising how the fears come jumping out of nowhere. The same fears that uh, have been at the edge of our consciousness all the time and we haven't faced them. If we're facing things like death, we're facing fears. We're facing things that are making our life unpleasant. So, in order to assuage some of these fears, let's look at what some of the great minds in history have had to say about death and how it has improved and made their lives much better. When Socrates was facing death, he was he had a death by drinking hemlock because he was considered a danger to the city of Athens by teaching its young men dangerous things like truth. <laughs> And they wanted him to run away and live in exile outside of Athens. And when the subject of death came up, he said, Why should I fear death when I have sought it all of my life? Because death will be the proving of my life. It will be the proving of whether I have been a philosopher. Moreover, he thought that when he died, he could go among the dead and he could ask them questions and uh, learn from them just as he had been doing when he was living. Socrates believed in the truth and he trusted the still small voice so much that he welcomed feedback of any kind to any part of his life. In our times, there has been a very interesting man named Carlos Castaneda wrote some fascinating books and the hero in those books is a Yaki Indian teacher called Don Juan Matos and he, has, he says positive things about death also he tells Carlos remember that death is over your left shoulder live with that knowledge he means that death is really an adversary. Carlos Castaneda, we can't live by that kind of philosophy. I can't live by that. There are some parts of it that are excellent. Uh, their ideas about retrospection are superb. They spend years almost exclusively at retrospection alone. But they've got some really good ideas. One of them is called the petty tyrant. In the petty tyrant is the person that is an SOB in your life. Somebody that makes life miserable to you and would just as soon crush you under their heel. And Don Juan teaches Carlos that that's the most valuable person in your life. Because those people don't let you get away with anything and those people show you exactly where you stand and that you, you should not fall to them, but you should be grateful that you have people like that in your life. Let's look to our Lord. Our Lord says, he who saves his life shall lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. This is what we've been implying. That if we try to save our life by hiding from death, we actually destroy our life. The more we can live by the principle of Christ, the better we are. So in any case, when we look at it from the eyes of people who are obviously great, people who have seen a lot in life and have mastered a good deal of it, we find out that death is not only inevitable, it is good. It is a very good thing. It's good to live a life, to live a life that is a good life, and to live as long as we can, 
but it is also good to welcome death when it comes. Now, even though we're going to be exploring death through the findings of mystic seers, it's always good to proceed as much as we possibly can from our own experience, verified first-hand experience. This means from our intuition and using all the other faculties available to us, our senses, our thinking, our feeling, all of them we can put to work with good observation. In this, we can greatly benefit by things that we see in our lives that pertain to death. Now, experience teaches us that the longer and closer we observe something, the more the spirit that is in us can associate itself with the thing that we're observing and from that observation the spirit can then find the truth and the meaning of it. Fortunately, except for Brad, most of us have been around and have been observing for quite a long time of life and so our introduction to the life cycle in terms of observation will be well-founded. It won't be something foreign to us. In the astrological horoscope, the opportunity to experience matters of life and death is indicated by the eighth house. The eighth house is a house of mysteries and of hidden things. It is the invisibles. The second house represents objects, things that we see right in front of us. But when the objects are gone, then we can see what their meaning is. If you lose a finger, you say, I never knew what that finger meant to me until it wasn't there. Similarly, with friends, when they have passed on, we don't know what they meant until they are gone. Now, assigning the eighth house to death is a very apt assignation. Things that occur before birth and after death are mysteries to us. Most of us, not all, but most, can't see where an infant comes from. We've got scientific instruments that we can see the egg and the sperm, and we can watch the whole process of fetal development very carefully. But where the character, the spiritual being, and any mother can tell you, that character is there from the very earliest times on. It's well formed. Where that comes from, the science can't tell you that at all. The origin is a mystery, but once the child is born, it's obvious that there is a character there. Now, in order to get at those invisibles, the things that are hidden from us before birth and after death, we have to realize that there is a truth that runs from the invisible worlds through the visible worlds that we live in. Now, there are things that we can observe in life and do so regularly that pass from the invisible into the visible and then back into the invisible. Let's <coughs> look at two such processes. We'll be we have really technical terms here. One of those processes can be termed looking forward. Now, that's a technical term. <laughs> At first, an infant can't look forward. It can't do a lot of things on its own. It's given plenty of help, plenty of guidance, 
by parents and family and friends and those who love it help it to focus its vision and to be able to move its body and there's plenty of reinforcement there's plenty of encouragement and praise and all of that which really helps the forward moving progress myself I can still remember the first step I took and it's not because I have a prodigious memory it's because it's one of the experiences that I got the most feedback ever in my life the walking wasn't as much of a wonder as how happy everyone else was about it it was such a thing you know it was it was it, to me it was great <laughs> Once the forward looking has been initiated and once it becomes volitional, it continues throughout life. The infant looks forward to crawling, to standing, to walking on its own, to feeding, to going to school, to learning how to drive having a mate, having a profession, and having children, and having grandchildren, once that process has been fully realized, the forward going and the forward looking is a dominant thing in our life. Now there are several things that accompany or that are corollary to the process of looking forward. One is that when we revolve forward in life, we become more involved in our bodies and in life and in the world. The more we look forward, the more that happens. And we could say then that the forward moving or the forward revolving brings one to be more deeply incarnated. Each year, we see how this works, and we can do something about it. We become more comfortable with it. Each year, as we are more involved from looking forward and of being aware to the world, we recognize we have more of a power. One of the professors I worked with at the university, had, he, was, he was great at getting the most he could out of grad students. And he had a little plaque on his wall that said, Youth and brilliance are no match for old age and treachery. <laughs> Not necessarily edifying, but it has the fact that we're trying to get to. That as we become involved in the world, we have more experience and we know more about the world. That same thing could be said with more edification, but it's a, the principle is correct nonetheless. However, this incarnating process comes at a price. And the price is that, that the more we look forward, which brings us to incarnate more, we become progressively more like the world. That is, we become harder. The embryo begins as a little blob. It's almost liquid. When an infant is born, its bones are almost rubbery. Some of the ones in the skull aren't even completed yet. And as one gets older, one becomes progressively more stony. The skin gets hard, the bones get brittle, and we br <laughs> but it's it's the truth now this process of looking forward in life goes on throughout life but as we pass the middle of life it seems to slow down if you talk with people who are past their prime 
especially older folks, you'll very commonly hear this the sentence, I'm slowing down. There's not a lot of forward looking. The slow down is especially notable with the deaths of parents. When the parents die, there is no generation ahead of you to follow, to look forward to, to emulate. You're it. You're the older generation. And at that point, you slow down appreciably. Now let's look at the other process. The other process isn't there at the beginning of life. It starts somewhere along the way, but it accelerates in life while the looking forward is decelerating. It usually begins with births, but not one's own birth. The birth of a younger sibling, but especially with the birth of one's own child or one's friend's child. When it begins, one starts to look back. These are technical terms, forward-looking and backward-looking, very technical. If it's a younger sibling, one might say, he has privileges that I didn't have. We've all heard that in families. In the case of a new parent, the wonder of an infant and all of those developmental stages that are going on causes one to ponder one's own childhood. When we went through it, we weren't aware that we were going through stages, and we don't have much of a memory of that. So, with parenthood, we begin to look back. And that process is accelerated throughout life and it is given great acceleration and meaning with the birth of grandchildren. When grandchildren are born, one is not only watching their children develop, they're watching their children watch their children develop. And having that removed vantage where you're watching two generations develop and looking back on that gives one a light feeling, sort of a be, of being above it all and abstracted. And with that feeling, grandparents can be much more indulgent. They're not so responsible. They're, you know, that the little child and all those stages that need special things at each stage, those are not things that the grandparent has to watch about, watch. So there is a removal that takes place with looking back. So at the same time, looking forward brings us into our body and hardens us. Looking backward lifts us out of our body and it produces a kind of detachment. We don't, you know, we're not attached to things so much anymore. I've got a nice car, but it's not the same thing as when you're young. When you're young, hey, this is my car, and it's an important thing to me. When you get older, you're not attached to that so much. So, there are these two forces, or these two processes is a better way of saying it, looking forward and looking backward. Sometimes, when they converge, it's like us being inside of a nutcracker. For example, when we are incarnated and part of that incarnate experience is pain and it, it has to do with the hardening of the body that comes with looking forward, it makes life pretty tough to go on sometimes. At the same time, while we're looking back, we're becoming detached and we don't have to live in all of that pain. But the combination of the pain and the ability to look back and free ourselves from attachment to this world 
makes for amazing changes that can happen in the older times of life. Now, there comes a time when the impulse to go forward is tired out. The will to live that produced that impulse, that produced this incarnation, has its limits. It can't go forward, and when it does, it lets go. The body dies, and uh, the forward-going activity is done, at least for a while. Now, what we've looked at here is the general case. There are special cases, and they each have quite significant nuances to them. Sometimes uh, children die before the parents, and the order of things is changed. We don't have time to go into those things, but uh, this is the process that we're trying to get at, the winding in and the winding out process. We even say it, you know, we say, well, I like to kick back and unwind. Now, these principles of looking forward and looking backward are fundamental and they're universal. They not only work while we're alive, they work throughout the life cycle. And they work in many things, including the entire evolutionary creation of which we are part. The whole cosmos looks forward and incarnates deeper and deeper into matter until the central point, and then we start looking backward and we're loosened and withdrawn. We use this intentionally as a practice. In the morning, in the Rosicrucian Fellowship, its students start from the very beginning from the original word, in the beginning was the word, and we follow that word right down into the flesh, and it brings us cleanly into our body. At night, we look backwards, just like at death. We look backwards, and we're pulled out of our body. The worst thing you can do when you go to bed is to think about what you're going to do tomorrow. Because if you think about what you're going to do tomorrow, that's winding you into the body. You don't sleep well, and you can't have a better tomorrow because you didn't sleep well. Now, in the case of death, you have no choice. Death has that finality. Now, earlier when we spoke about death, we gave the impression that death like birth, is a very special time. A special time when special care and precautions must be taken. Well, that's both true and not true at the same time. It's not true in that the spirit is immortal. The spirit doesn't die. It just is. It has been, and it will be, in spirit. So it's unfazed by things of the world like life and death. Relatively unfazed. In a way, for the spirit, death is not a great deal different than walking out the door. It's just that you go out the door and you're in a different circumstance. And that's the way spirit sees things. But it is also true that death is special in several ways. When we die to this outer material world, we're born to the more inner spiritual worlds. And there are similarities. It's often reported at the moment of death that the person dying sees old friends old relatives, people that they were closely attached to, that have come to greet them and bring them into the world of death. In the last few days before my father died, 
he was seeing his uh, second wife and he was seeing people who uh, came to greet him. There are significant differences, though, between birth and death. The most significant is the fact that the backward-looking and detaching process can now go on unabated. It's unchecked. And the unwinding will continue until that impulse is spent just like the winding forward went as far as it could go. So we unwind with little or no resistance after we die. For one thing, this means that we're resetting everything in our consciousness. And it also means that when we have left this world, because we're so absorbed in the unwinding process, that it's very hard to come in contact with people in the physical world. Very hard to do that because our whole process, we're being swept along by the unwinding of all the things we wound into our existence, and it's very hard to come back. If you note the cases among ordinary people coming back, they come back only in very special instances, like if a mother has died and her child is imperiled, something like that can cause a great intense effort so that the person can come back and help the living. But it's pretty rare. I know that people are going to say, but what about all of those people that show up at seances? That's a whole group of people that somehow want to be here in the material world even if they can't learn much. They can't learn much because they don't have the forward-going consciousness to learn things and consolidate things. And so there are people that learn how to steal energy from other people and they learn how all kinds of tricks that they can work with mediums or channelers or whatever. They call themselves guides. Sometimes they call themselves angels. Sometimes they call themselves spirit mentors. And there are a whole bunch of people that have spent a lot. You know, there are people that have a kind of consciousness that find it much more engaging to work against the law or outside of the law than in it. They'll go to great extents to do something illegal. Usually it's people who have afflictions with Saturn and Mercury that think like that. They, they'll go to great lengths to do anything but obey the law. And people do this uh, because they're kind of earthbound. Now, because the spirit is spirit, and because it's immortal, it proceeds on with its consciousness. Now, we cannot usually participate in this world or precipitate new things in this world, but that doesn't mean that we can't do it sometimes. All right, let's take a very close look at the moment immediately after death. Now, we just finished going as far as we were going to go in a sub-series talking about the spiritual worlds. That sub-series was called, What is Nora? And we noted that mystic seers found that the dense body is suspended within an etheric vital body. And that vital body is a matrix. It's a matrix into which the form of our physical body is built. That vital body is composed of ethers. And we said that there were two kinds of ethers. Four different levels, but two basic types. One kind was called the biological ethers because they maintain the physical body and all of its biological needs. They include the chemical ether and the life ether. 
The other set of ethers are called the soul ethers. They are the light ethers and the reflecting ether. We mentioned at that time that one of the functions of the light ether was perception and the conveyance of perceptions. And we mentioned that one of the functions at the negative pole of the reflecting ether was memory. That we had a memory in the reflecting ether that was a total memory. Everything that happens, like what's been happening in here since we started this talk about 45 minutes ago, all of that is impressed in our etheric body. More than we have in our conscious memory. Whatever moods and attitudes were in the air are also impressed in that memory. It is quite a remarkable memory. It's got everything in it. Now, when we were talking about vital body, we mentioned that there was a breath record. That some things we draw in through the perception process by seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching. Those are limited senses. We can't see the full panorama. We can't see 360 degrees. We can't hear all of the sounds. So the memories and the experiences that are transported through the ethers in uh, through the sensory perception is different than what happens with the breath record. The breath record is total. Every time we breathe in, the ether that is in the air goes into our bloodstream and the etheric part of the bloodstream carries it to every atom in the body and it gets impressed on each atom the images of what has occurred. There is one special atom that is called the seed atom of the dense physical body. And it contains the essence of every experience we have had in every body that we have been in. Not only as through the many, many years that we have been human-like, but our whole animal-like existence, our whole plant-like existence, going back millions and billions of years, the essence of every experience of form that we have ever had is built into the seed atom of our heart. It's like a permanent record of form. Each of the bodies has its own seed atom. For as long as we have been plant-like and have been able to have an etheric vital body, we have had a record of the essence of all of those experiences. Similarly, in the liver, we have a seed atom of all of the experiences of emotion we've ever had, every last one. So this seed atom of the dense physical body is, contains everything. During life, it's suspended in the left ventricle of the heart. It gets the blood immediately when it comes back from the lungs. When a person dies, that seed atom is detached from the heart and it leaves the body. And it leaves the body through what is called a silver cord. The silver cord is mentioned in the Bible. Solomon mentions it in the Bible. And it's a strand of ether and desire stuff and thought stuff that has been specialized. It's sort of like a super highway. It's like a connection. It's like the hotline between United from Washington and Moscow. They had to have that special connection. In the body, it's like two figure sixes interlocked together, that is, two spirals interlocked together, and the part that is attached to the physical body, it snaps at the middle of those sixes, and part of the silver cord remains back with the physical body, 
but all of the seed atom and all of those memories proceed out with it. The silver cord in the body follows roughly the path of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve used to be called the pneumogastric nerve, and it's the longest cranial nerve in the body. Ooh, all right, that was 45 minutes, great. Now, when the seed atom of the physical body has passed out of the dense body, it's detached. It's exactly as Solomon says in Ecclesiastics, when the, when the silver board, cord has been snapped, life is over and you can't go back to it. Then a very short but very important period of time happens. The point that we have been trying to stress in all of these talks is the spirit lives on the stuff of experience. Experience is exceedingly important. All experience, no matter what it is, what we're going through is important. And a life that has a lot of experience, varied experience, intense experience, is a valuable life. If you lay around and do nothing, that's not a valuable life. The spirit will learn things through the metabolism of the body, but if you, it's not like the same thing if you're doing deep sea diving, or if you're experiencing literature, or if you're, you know, leading a bicycle ride across the country. The more experience you get, the better. And the deeper in that it sinks, the better it is for you. So what happens in the etheric body is that once it is free from the impulse of going forward, which counters it, and once it is free from the physical body, it begins to unwind. And in the unwinding, you see every event that you saw in your life. And you see more than you experienced in life, though you may not recognize it. We can only recognize what we have learned to see. And if all of our recognition is, is based on the senses, we don't pick everything up. Not, at least not with full self-consciousness. So this unwinding takes a longer or shorter time depending on the consciousness of the individual that is watching the pictures. As long as uh, the individual could stay awake under the most trying circumstances, that's how long the pictures will last. That is, if a person has a span of attention that, that they could only stay awake in emergency 24 hours, they'll go through the pictures in 24 hours and that'll be the end. Obviously, if you see the whole life in 24 hours, it's not being impressed as deeply as if you see the whole life in three and a half days. Three and a half days is the maximum limit. So if you're looking at them very slowly and very carefully and they're sinking in, you're getting the most out of life and you're getting the stuff of life with the best quality possible. Now, because things are unwinding, things are seen in reverse order. That's important. We're going to see that uh, in several ways, the importance of that. So the last thing that we did before death will be the first thing that we see. And we'll continue backward and backward and backward. And everything that happens with the experience of the life we've just gone through will be in that kind of order. The reason this is so important is we say to ourselves all the time, if I had known better, I wouldn't have done what I did. Or if I had known better, I would have 
done things in a different way. This is what the spirit does when it learns from life. Therefore, if all of the experience of life is lost, we have nothing to look back on and say, I could have done something there that would have changed my life and the life of my friends all around me for the better. So if the experience is lost, the growth is lost. And its experience is so precious, so valuable. Each moment that we are here, we get so much that we don't want to lose any of it. If we are spiritual students especially, we should be greedy for life. We should try to take in as much as we can take in and live it to the very best of our ability. So this is important that we do not lose this information. Now, it's not totally lost. It's somewhere also it's stored in the world of thought in the memory of nature there. But it might be several thousand years before we can access it in that memory and consciously gain from it the way we can gain from the ethereal. So you don't want to, you know, nobody wants to have lived in vain. Nobody wants their life to have been wasted. You want to get out of it. You want, you know, you want something to offer to the world. You want something to uh, give to the ongoing process. You want to be part of the creation. Now, if the physical body is destroyed in a fire, if it's burned up, those records are lost from the ethers. They're still in the other memory of nature, but they're lost. Now, that's a case that you can't control. If a person is to die by fire, then they have that kind of destiny. You have no control of that. But if the, there is still some connection to the physical body, as long as these images are being looked at, so if anything is done to the physical body, while you're looking at the images, the sensation is felt. It's felt in the desire body. That's where we feel all sensations. Yes, there's an impression that happens in the physical body, but the registering of it occurs in the desire body. And there is a sympathetic connection between the desire body and the physical body. So if somebody is doing an autopsy, or if they're doing extreme measures to bring you back to life, or if they're harvesting organs, I don't know if you know how, how, how organ harvesting goes. Organ harvesting within two minutes. They just cut your entire body open and they get things out of there. Repsco depsco, just as fast as can be, it's out of there. And there are all kinds of uh, impressions that are going into the desire body and distracting you so that you can't see these images. Embalming also does that. And they don't have to be physical distractions. If you're at a place where there's a lot of noise going on, and especially if it's noise about you, if people are wailing and lamenting and doing all of those kinds of things, it distracts your attention. And this is the time in life that you do not want distraction. So, in Rosicrucian Christian mysticism, where the people have, by clairvoyant observation, watched the whole death process, the conclusion is the very best thing you can do when a person has died is put the body in a cool place or it won't deteriorate, do nothing to it in terms of embalming or anything like that, and keep it quiet. A morgue is really a nice place. We think of it as a gruesome place, but it's quiet. Nobody bothers things there. It's cool, and everything is uh, done just well. So you leave it on ice for three and a half days. You're always hoping that the person who has left 
has that attention span that they can go the three and a half days. So, one of the effects is that as we look backwards, there is an unwinding and there is a detachment. And what happens in this detachment is, normally in life, it's like in our physical body, the solids and liquids and gases are all together. They're, you know, they're fused together as one common thing. The same is true with the ethers. But when the great panoramic retrospection after death occurs, the soul ethers get separated or detached from the biological ethers which stay behind the body. After those three and a half days, it doesn't make much difference what you do with the material body. Because often, well, I find that, I get asked about this a lot, often there are people, they want a Masonic funeral, or often there are people that want, uh, you know, their church says to do this, you got to give closure to the, uh, you know. After the, <coughs> after the three and a half days are over, I'm just happy that the person got what they had the chance to do. Probably the best thing you can do after, after the three and a half days is to burn the body so that there's nothing to be attached to in this world and give everything back to the elements. But if people want to go through their funerary services and all of that, let them do it. Uh, let them have their time, you know, as long as the three and a half days are spent so that nothing is lost. So this is extremely, extremely important. If you get nothing else out of this entire talk, get this out of it. This is what I did. I went to an attorney. I'll pass it around. I went to an attorney and uh, said, this is what I want to do with my body after death, and I want it to be legal. And so I made up a little card, and the attorney notarized it, and it tells exactly what to do with my body, and I carry it with me wherever I go. I have one also, what to do in case of illness. I have somebody that has a medical power of attorney, somebody that knows that I don't want organ transplants, and I don't want the extreme measures taken. Uh, I lost that on the way out here, unfortunately, so I have to make a new one. But to have cards like that to carry around, a very, very important thing. Now, People sometimes experience this while they're living. I worked with a man that was very conservative, but he was kind of peculiar. And in his peculiarity, he was sensitive to things I would say about spiritual things. So here he was like a real uh, political, he, politically he was very reactionary, very conservative. But spiritually, he was open. And then I found out. I was talking about these things one day at work. And he pulled me aside later. He says, you know, what you're saying is true. He says, when I was very young, I almost drowned. And he said, uh, I saw everything in my life. And it was backwards. And it, he said, it was the big experience of my life. You can't, the thing of it is, those pictures are so total that even if it all doesn't register with your waking consciousness, it registers with the spirit. And it makes for a transformed person. And this person's life was transformed. So it sometimes happens if you're, if you're close to drowning or if you fall from a high place and you're pulled out of your body that way or if you happen to be someone who takes, uh, so-called recreational drugs, you can have the kind of experience where you're taken out of your body and you see your life backwards. Uh, it's the, the, the effect is there. In many ways, you will be a significantly changed and reformed person. You won't be what you were before. Now, it's time to say something really simple. The universe is just that. The universe is the universe. It's one. Therefore, if it's all one stuff and all one spirit, 
if we're going to do new things, we have a limit because it's all within the one. Therefore, everything in the cosmos must be recycled. And if it's recycled, what has been done with it must be undone. Now, we've talked about the way the physical and etheric are undone. Now, for a little while, let's talk about the way the desire body must also be undone. There are some very fascinating things about the way the desire body unwinds. If you'll remember when we talked about the desire body, we said it was composed of our desires. We also said that it was in its very infantile state of development. It had no organs in it. It has seven vortices that are more or less well defined and that it is basically egg shaped. Everything seems to start with an egg shape in these worlds, the physical worlds. And so it was a generalized egg shape. Now all of the bodies interact with each other. They're just different parts or different levels of the same thing. They all serve one spirit. We, in our way, are little universes. We are microcosms. We are one. Now, usually, they work together for mutual benefit. We have this condition right now that the lower nature sneakily tries to subvert it the workings of the higher nature, we've got something of that in us, but that's only temporary in terms of evolution. But the desire body normally tires us out. There's a constant war between the desire body and the vital body. We desire this, and we desire that, and we desire that, and pretty soon we've tired out the vital body and we have to pull out of it and go to sleep. Now, the desire body wants things, and it reaches out for things. And when the desire body reaches out for things, it moves the physical body, it motivates it to reach out. And in the desire body, there are sweeps of desire energy that are impulses. Like if I reach out for this object, that has a sweep of desire for me to reach for it. Gradually, very, very gradually, where there is a sweep of desire in the physical body, the counterpart of desire develops. And the counterpart of desire in the physical body is muscles. So, because these muscles allow us to move, allow us to reach out and do things. So gradually our physical body is built in its musculature by desire. Now, any musician can tell you this. I lived with a man who composed music on the guitar, and he did fabulous things with the guitar. Anything that he could imagine in his mind, he could make his fingers do, but he couldn't do it immediately. When you want to do something, it takes a while for the muscles to develop to do the thing you want to do. Now, that's an interaction between the desire body and the physical body. So it may take a few weeks uh, time, and in that few weeks time, gradually the muscles will grow and you'll become strong, and uh, you'll be able to do that. After death, just the opposite thing occurs. The things that we experienced in the desire body, when we have viewed them by observation in the past life panorama, 
they become impressions in the desire body. The region of impressionability. Remember when we talked that, about that when we were talking about the desire body? So what happens with the desire body roughly of what the physical body needs to be. Because the physical body, the most find some way to deal with that. The most stable form of the physical body is in the muscles. And according to that form, that stable form, those desires that were muscles, they get built back into the desire body. And the desire body looks like what we used to look like in our musculature when we were in the physical body. So it's no longer an ovoid, but it looks like this. Now, <laughs> this explains some unusual phenomena. Something that most people could never know, could never guess why it was. Now, I have a friend that had a slight degree of clairvoyance. And he came to me one day and he said to me, I thought everybody had an aura. And I said, everybody does have a desire body. But he said, I just saw a man that was a peculiar man and he had no aura. He says, I don't think you're right. He says, there is no aura. You know what it was? It was a case of spirit possession. The owner of the body had been driven out, and someone who was from among the dead, whose body, desire body, was now the shape of the physical body, took over that body, and when that body was taken over to an ordinary clairvoyant, the desire body, as a, as a big aura, wasn't there. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of phenomena that are uh, that occur that way. Uh, a nasty entity. And, well, some people give up their bodies. Uh, some people lose their head and lose their body also. Yes, that's what I just said. You lose your head. You, yes. You, you get very angry and you lose control of your body and you, get, you are then pushed out of it. Somebody takes over. Now, there are extreme cases where the shape of the body in the desire world is not like what we see normally. Among human beings, we have some really odd people. So there are seers who report things, like suppose there is someone that was a huge gossip and a huge liar, and that told lie after lie after lie. Their attention, in a false way, is put into their tongue so much that when the shape of the physical body is built into the desire body, it isn't exactly like it was here. And so there are beings walking around in the desire world that have to hold their tongue like they're, hold, they're, like they're holding uh, an armload full of wood. Uh, obviously, there must be people that have penises that are like logs that they have to carry around in the desire world. There are strange things there. People who have drug experiences or unfold a low grade of clairvoyance, they describe really odd things and they don't know how they came about, but we can do some awfully weird thinking. I had a friend once that had uh, saw a horse with arms coming out of the side of it that went up to the spine of the horse and just pulled the uh, body open like that. I don't know what kind of thinking would produce that kind of form. Now, something else happens. And it's a complementary kind of thing. Remember when we talked about the desire world, we said there was a law of within without. That is, if you selfishly 
drew things to you, you radiated out something that repulsed people. On the other hand, if you sacrificially, forgetting about yourself, gave love to other people, then that attracted people to you. So the, the, the within, without principle works. And it works after death, too. So that when your desire body gets concentrated into the form of the physical, the experience of the inward attention goes out to the extents of the cosmos, the desire body of the world. So your desire body, the, your desire body is the shape of your physical, but you experience the desires throughout the desire world. So wherever in those realms you have desire experience, you feel that way. You feel at, at I don't know how I have to go clear about that, you feel in that dimension. And the experience is, uh, I had a friend once that used to have drug experiences that described this, this, this very phenomenon she called it the fat skinny, that she was aware of her body, but she was also aware that her consciousness was spread out all over the place, like she was fat, you know, like only fat in the, in the like in light ear uh, proportions. So the experience of consciousness is all over, and it is it takes the form of where we manifest significant desired experiences the most. So suppose I did somebody wrong here in California, and I did something else on the East Coast in the desire world when I re-experienced that, I would feel it from the extents of those places, even though there was a focusing in the desire body. So your whole body, it's a, it's a very weird kind of experience. When you are out of your body, you're both in your soul body, but you're also a cosmic citizen. Your consciousness goes the whole extent of the cosmos. Now, when we talked about the desire world and the desire body, we said that the force of attraction in the desire world was present throughout the desire world while the force of repulsion was only present in the lower spheres. We said at that time, giving love is what produced attraction. It is a general principle that the force of sacrifice or the character of sacrifice in the cosmos is experienced as warmth. Even warmth in our bodies is a sacrifice of some kind. Like the heater right there, that's entropic energy that has been sacrificed and it's going back to chaos and on the way back it gives warmth. Now, when love is expressed in the desire world as desire, and it is intense desire, and it is a frictional kind of desire, it is experienced as intense heat. You've all heard of a burning desire, or somebody burning with love. This is why some people who have maintained these kinds of desires, especially repulsive desires, where the sacrifice is not a sacrifice, their desires become so intense and they have no way to fulfill them and to discharge them and it gives, in effect, an emotion of burning sensation. And this is where the idea of a hell comes from, that you're going to burn in hell eternally. It's not eternally. There is no such place as a hell where people are tortured or punished. Torture and punishment are just perverse human ideas. They are not part of the cosmos. They're not built into the cosmos. What we're talking about are impersonal principles of nature. God 
is not a respecter of persons as the Bible tells us. If we choose by our desires to produce hellish conditions, that's just an objective feedback. If I give you a bad talk, or if I say something that's obviously untrue, you can give me feedback. And that feedback may not be pleasant, but it's certainly helpful. It's exactly what you get for what you've put out. And so this is what happens in the desire world. There's no punishment. It's, we're not even punishing ourselves. We're just doing what we do, and the result is a natural result. It is action, reaction. So let's try to look at this a little more clearly and uh, return to the fundamentals of the desire world. Ooh, this is going to be a long talk. We've we got a good way, a good long ways to go yet. Now, in the world of Christian philosophy, we term the worlds according to their function. The desire world and the desire body are called such because they give us the function of desire. Desire that motivates us to do things, or desire that motivates us to not do things. Now, a given thing can be used in different ways. It used to be that my kitchen was of places that were all the flat, all the silverware was mangled. If you use a table knife to turn in a screw, it's no longer a table knife, it's a screwdriver, right? And because it wasn't built for that, it sometimes gets mangled and bent. But I, I used to be one of those people that didn't take the time to get the right tool. I wanted to do it now. So, it's no longer a table knife, it is a, um, it is a screwdriver. Now, in some schools of thought, the desire world is not called the desire world. It's called the world of the animals, because, this, because the animals are specializations, each species is one kind of desire. This is where the whole idea of totem animals comes from. And it is the realm from which the group spirits of the animals, where, where they work from. So it's, per, it's perfectly feasible to call the desire world the world of the animals. Now, the lower desire world, where we unwind our base repulsive desires, the function of that is it's purging us of what is dark. So, the lower desire world is sometimes called, in the afterlife activity, is called purgatory. Unfortunately, there are lots of religious notions about that, and uh, those religious notions are filled with all kinds of superstitions and hearsay and things like that. But what we're talking about is we're not talking about a theological speculation. We're talking about the functionality of how the desire world works. The unwinding is continuing, and it's going fast. It's going faster than we live our lives. And it's also going in reverse order, as unwinding must go. However, the reverse order here has a different sequencing. When we looked at the etheric vehicle, the unwinding, the time sequence went exactly according to the way time in this world goes. This follows this, follows this. So when you unwind, you go in exactly that reverse order. That's not quite the way things work in the desire world. There are some things that are so gross that they're more repulsive. And the more repulsive they are, the sooner they will tear themselves apart. This is why we go through purgatory, 
before we go through the remembering of the finer desires. Because the finer desires don't have that repulsion in them. And they dissolve at a slower rate and they just, it's not as important for them to be gotten rid of. So, what happens is in purgatory, the lower grade of desires, the coarse desires, the things that are filled with selfish repulsion go first, especially if we have some kind of dependence on them. If we smoke, or we take alcohol, and we, we're, those are acts of self-hatred. They have a lot of repulsion in them. We hate ourselves, and we don't want to face reality. A lot of people drink alcohol to forget. They feel that if they can forget their problems, they can live a life that's happy and hilarious, and so they drink. Now, this whole process of things degrading or unwinding or rotting or deteriorating in the lower desire world, we know that from an old folk statement. This is a folk statement for almost everything in the cosmos. We know there is no honor among thieves. There is only mutual destruction. And that's exactly what happens. But again, you can't make a hard and fast rule about it. Because there's another factor. That factor is repetition. The more we repeat a desire, the more it gets ingrained into the stuff of our desire bodies. In fact, it is so much so that we have what the psychologists would call a complex or a constellation that if we think, for example, certain kinds of deleterious thoughts and we desire things from other people and desire things from other people, a form will shape in, will, will come in our desire body that could manifest as a bat. You could say that somebody has a bat in their, in their aura and that's because they have those kinds of desire. So repetition, it isn't only the most coarse things that rot first. Some of the coarse things take a longer time to unwind because they've been repeated many times and they are a pretty solid factor in the desire body. Another thing is intensity. The intensity of desire causes a desire to last longer. The more intensely we feel something, the longer that stays with us. The events in life where we have manifested great emotional intensity causes impressions in the ethers that those memories are stronger than others. And it causes the stuff, because the desire body is made of our desires. So if we have really intense desires, they're going to be strong things, and they are going to endure longer. Another thing is attachment. If we're attached to a desire, we sometimes don't give up. Even after death, we hang on and on and on with that attachment. This is why people who have addictions or who have been very greatly habituated to something have a really hard time in purgatory. Then there's one other factor, and that is integrity. We have all, at some time, probably all right now, lie to ourselves about things. We won't admit the truth. And just because we're dead doesn't mean we're changed. We might continue to lie to ourselves. And sometimes the biggest lies that we have are our beliefs. We believe that something is one way or another, and we won't let go of that lie. It is said that John Calvin spent an enormously long time in purgatory. Enormously, like hundreds of years. And the reason was, it wasn't the way he believed it was. He couldn't possibly be dead because 
with his philosophical belief system, he, it, it wasn't like this when you died. And so he was going through, the, he, he couldn't go through the normal process of purgatory the way everybody else goes through it because he wouldn't admit to the truth. It was sort of a kind of a negative integrity. But at any rate, you can see, we live our lives over in the desire world in some kind of reverse order. It is the temporal reverse order, but on the, the desire world of what comes first and what comes second. There's another curious reversal that takes place, and that has to do with what we spoke about earlier, the principle of within and without. Now, if our consciousness is at the expense of the desire, macrocosmic desire world, and the unwinding or the deterioration of the desire body is in this center, we experience things coming at us that we, when we were inside, we put them out, or we drew them to us. But things are exactly reversed when the perspective is reversed. Therefore, if I, oh, I know people who have beaten animals, and they beat the animals severely, so when you re-experience that desire, that vehement thing, like I'm going to show this animal what's what, and cause an enormous amount of pain to that animal, when you experience from the desire world, you're exceedingly sensitized, because you don't have a physical body anymore, and you feel it as it came out of you. So all of that pain and vehemence and everything else that came out of you, you feel. What you gave is what you get. You can't feel something other than what you created your desire body of. And you get the total experience. So like in the etheric world, when you see things backwards, you see things from effect to cause. In the desire world, when you feel things, when you see things backwards or experience things backwards, you experience them from action, from reaction to action. So you get a total objective view. Now the thing of it is, when you go through this process, when you have felt it from the inside out, and then in the purgatorial realms from the outside in, everything that we put into that desire that was our own, that wasn't just the desire stuff itself, everything is neutralized. It's discharged. And that's sort of like when the physical body rots, when there's no forces to hold it together, the stuff goes back to the earth. Similarly, in the desire world, when we have discharged everything that is in a given desire uh, by refueling it, then it is, the essence is built into the seed animal of the desire body, but the desire stuff goes back to the, uh, to the uh, desire world. This gives us a total comprehension. When we're living our lives, we live only in part. We only see half the story. And this is like, what's that newscaster? And now for the rest of the story, you know what I mean? And that's, this is what happens with purgatory. We could speak of special cases. We could see it, say what happens to addicts or tyrants or sycophants or all people like that. But those are things that you can experience for yourself. If you follow your own desires out, you can see what happens to those people. And we're way, way long. We're only on page seven of the notes, and I think there are about nine or ten pages to this. And uh, it's a very slow, yes, there are nine pages. We have just finished page seven. The important thing is that the examples are very good. They're exemplary, and it pays to read these stories. But the thing that's most important is to remember that the desires are real. They're important. They are significant. So we don't just say, 
it was only an emotion that I was going through. It was an emotion, and that's the reality, and it happens to be a very important reality, and we can't just dismiss it. Now, when we spoke about the desire world beginning, we said that the curious thing about it was that we entered into the desire world in the middle. We didn't work from the top down, we didn't work from the bottom up. The reason for that is, is any experience in the desire world has to begin as a feeling. And the way the mystics use the word feeling is that there are just two feelings, and one is very strange. The two feelings are interest and indifference. Now, indifference is sort of means that there is going to be no desire. It means that there is going to be no motivation. In that region of feeling, then, if we were people that expressed indifference. We have to live with that. The desire world is there for function. It's a world to itself. We can live in a very wonderful emotional life. But functionally, the desire world is there to motivate us. The cosmos the evolutionary creation is a dynamic activity. It's there to do something. And therefore, it's important that we be motivated to do something. That means it's important that we be interested. Now, the function of the desire world, of the region of feeling in the desire world, takes on a different name according to what is done there. It's sometimes called the borderland. And there are people that suffer in the borderland. But their suffering is not like the man who beat the horse, or not like the man who slandered and had all of that tongue. The suffering is an intense awareness of no feeling. From a spiritual point of view, it's better to be angry than to feel nothing at all. Because there at least will be experience that is garnered from the anger, but if you're indifferent to things, there will be no experience. So people, and there are whole philosophies that try to culture indifference. So people who do experience and intentionally become indifferent to things, when they find themselves in the desire world, there is an immense feeling of when something going to happen. You know, there's nothing that's happening. And that's terrible because the spirit is more wide awake. It wants to experience things. It wants to do something. And it feels like this is is going to be over. So again, this isn't a punishment. It isn't, and it isn't like you know, like none of us want to be taught a lesson. We don't want to have our nose rubbed in it. It's just what happens if we choose to live indifferently. That's what we're going to experience is indifference. It doesn't matter how long it really takes. Because it just feels like forever. Now the higher regions in the desire world also have a different name according to function. In the Christian Christian mysticism, it's called first heaven. Because what's happening there is one is unwinding or undoing or resetting all of the positive good like all of the good we've ever done, we feel. Sometimes, in our egoism, something I have problems with in my egoism, I don't like to have good things given to me. 
it hurts me. In some ways, there's humility in that. In some ways, it's sort of like I want to not hold the good things to myself alone. That's not a healthy kind of thing. It's important that when you do something good, because it's a you can't be selfishly selfish about high desires any more than you can be selfish about low desires. That would be being a respecter of persons. And that would be having you know, selfish opinionation. So if we have done good things, if we have caused people to feel loftier feelings, or if we have given them insight to artistic expression, we feel that. Because that's part of us. And through that, we know how wonderful it is. And when we know how wonderful it is, and we're not attached to it, we can we have motivation to move forward and to be positive. So the experience that we get when we relive our life in the desire body gives us conscience. Conscience is not just, I'm not going to do that because I know, and they don't, maybe not remember all the experiences from my past lives, but I know that produces unnecessary pain and suffering, and that's very hard for somebody. That's one part of conscience. The other part of conscience is, if I do this, I know that it will help someone to be more an integral part of the whole evolution that's going on. And people will know, you know, each of us will know in our conscience that this is a desirable thing to do. So what happens in the first heaven is we experience all of these feelings with perfect feedback. It's objective. What we put out we get back. And slowly, life by life, our desire bodies, when we rebuild them, have less and less of the baser kinds of desires. And slowly, life after life, we become more given people, more artistic people, more compassionate people. And we uh, correct all of our mistakes. And we build on our successes. Yes, yes. But I, I, I don't want to go off on something like that because I'm desperately cutting material here and uh, trying to go very, very fast. So, not all of our time is spent in this purgatorial activity. It's just a matter of fact that no matter how much we love something, no matter how interested we are in something, we can't keep our attention on it for really long. We have only so much attention. We don't have that eternal attention like God does. We're just beginners. For example, on weekends when I'm not giving these talks, I'm doing, instead of giving out, I'm trying to take in. If I'm going places, I'm doing drawing. Last Sunday, I went to Balboa Park and I sat on a stone for over four hours drawing three other stones and two cacti. It should have been 12 hours. I would have come out with a better drawing than what I did. What I did was not too great. But that's about my limit. Four and a half hours sitting in one place, even though it was wonderful looking at what was there and trying to reproduce it. And when you look at things with the artist's eye, even though I'm not an artist, when you look at things that way, everything is beautiful. One night last week, I drew a Tide soap bottle. And it had lovely curves in it. And it had lovely shadings of light and everything in it. It was only so long that you can hold your attention. 
So what happens in the desire world is the purgatorial experience or the heaven experience depends upon the integrity and the attention span. If you don't have the attention span, you get tired, and then other things are given for you to do. Not so much in the lower desire world, but as you rise into the higher desire world, because those desires take longer to dissolve because they're more eternal. The lower desires, because they are so repulsive, they knock each other apart very quickly. They disintegrate. But the higher desires take a long time to dissolve. An act of love may be around in the desire world of future. So, in the time that you're experiencing this, and you can't sustain the intention that long, you're given other things to do. Some people work with little babies that have been died in childbirth, or that were very young. And there are amazing things that they can do there. If a child, not off, often what happens is if a person dies in a fire in one life, and they miss the experience of that life, in the next life they're born in such a way that they die as a child. And when they die as a child, they don't go through the whole life cycle because their desire bodies never got really born. So they come back to birth very quickly. 10, 20 years, something like that, they come back to birth. But in those 10 or 20 years, they get makeup work for what they lost when their fire body was burned in the fire. So if people are among the dead and they're not doing the work of first heaven, what they do is they give an assignment where they take an infant or a child or something like that. The spirit knows, the spirit that's in there, and they'll take it to where there's a fist fight going on. Or they'll take it to where there is a war going on. And they'll take the child and they'll put it within the auras of the people that are experiencing those things. And they'll pull it out of the aura and then they'll take it to some place like where there's a symphony going on. And they'll put it in the aura of the musicians. And in that way, the infant gets side by side juxtaposed lessons of what it's like to have the lower destructive desires versus to have the higher desires. So that even if something is lost, if the uh, records are lost by a flame or something like that, compensation is made. It's like that. Even though everything happens, happens according to divine principle and law, that doesn't mean that we aren't part of the creative process and that even when we are among the dead, that we can't help out. We can see things, how things could be better, and we can do them. And that's the kind of thing that we do when we're in the higher desire world in between lives and we're not completely occupied. It's a wonderful kind of thing. We can do it right now. This is what the invisible helpers are. If we don't spend all of our time breaking our body down during the daytime because of all of our desires, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do that, if we're not so hard on ourselves, then at night when we go to sleep, we only take part of the night to restore the physical body. The rest of the night, we can get our, dedicate ourselves to doing service. And we can work as invisible helpers. And in that way, we can make it a better place. We can improve on things. And so everything that happens in each of the realms, in purgatory or in first heaven, all of those things we can take care of in the right here. This is the beauty of being involved in a spiritual system like this. We understand the process of what is going on. And we understand that we are agents in that process. And best of all, we understand that we are part of the divine creativity. And so we can creatively enter into the process 
and we can work with it, and we can make it better than we've ever done before. Now, there is, I don't think there's a better kind of philosophy of life than you can, that you can have than that. Because when you are co-created with God, and as wondrous as the universe is, you can be part of its creation, and we can be part of its creation on almost every level. Eventually, we do get finished with all of our desires. And then the spirit itself, with all of its seed atoms, seed atoms of the desire body with all of those experiences, seed atom of the etheric body with all of those experiences, and the seed atom of the dense physical body enters into the world of thought. And this period is called second heaven. Now the mind is in the very infancy of its development. It really isn't even a vehicle yet. We do have some thought stuff permeating and interpenetrating the desire body, but it's not yet like a whole body. It's pretty much like we're being born a little bit at a time. And so it's more like a sheet. The picture I get is my bird feeder, I have a uh, a mutation, a mutant starling. And that starling, instead of being all black like other starlings, is like a white tail. And it's not completely white. There are a few black, black feathers in there, so that it's mostly white. And it's like it's got a ragged edge between the white and the black. And that's a physical picture. In the spiritual world, you can say that some of the desire and nature and it isn't all at the head, but mostly at the head. Some people think of other parts of the body, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, but uh, some parts of the aura have suspended and interpenetrated in them another dimension and that dimension of thought. Now, as we mentioned before, most of our thinking, not all of it, the great majority of our thinking is about war. This is why the danger of materialism is so great, because we think primarily in the continental region of the world of thought, and therefore we think in terms of forms. And it's easy then to think it's all form, and it's a materialistic kind of thing. So, we said that the world of thought is a world of tone and a world of pitch. Now, this doesn't mean that there isn't light and that there isn't color and that there isn't form in the world of thought because there certainly are. In fact, the color is more beautiful than the color of the desire world. And the forms have more of a greater Fiction to them. But that essential thing is thought and tone. The most significant thing is tone. We are becoming gods. And God is an intelligence. So when we are in our conscience, consciousness in the world of thought, we are rethinking thought. We're looking back at our thoughts and undoing our thoughts. This is a very deep and mysterious process. We're going to talk about it later on in probably the most important talk that we give, and that will be the talk on soul growth. I will talk about it in detail there, so I won't talk about it a lot now. Now, there's one thing about entering into the second heaven that we've all experienced in a small way. It is something that we're slightly familiar with. The Rosicrucian philosophy calls it a great silence. And the great silence 
is like when you're alone with your thoughts. Sometimes you can get in a peaceful state but you don't move. You're like completely silent. There's no noise to distract you. No light to distract you. You're just alone with your thoughts. And you feel sometimes nothing is going on. That you're not even thinking. I think we've all experienced that once in a while, especially when we were young. We were uncomfortable with ourselves. And if there were a moment that we weren't active, we were uncomfortable because it feels like nothing is going on. We weren't ourselves unless we were doing something. It's only when we get older that we love and appreciate thought for what thought is. So it's like when you just silently sit down and you commune with your thoughts. When you're thinking, as if you're thinking on a new subject, it feels like there's nothing going on. And gradually, more and more things come to you and suddenly everything around you feels a buzz with thought. This is why it's important to write. Because whether we know it or not, we really are thinking beings. And we're doing a lot of thinking that we never bring to our attention. And when we start writing something down, somebody says, well, how do you feel about friendship? And you start writing about friendship, and before you know it, thoughts are crowding into your mind and you have so many things to say about friendship you never knew that you had those, those that many things to say. You did and you had them to say all along. It's just that you never brought them to your attention. And that's what it's like in the great silence. You're not aware of the fact that you're thinking. You're not aware of the fact that we live in an environment that is filled with thought. The whole cosmos is permeated with the intelligent thought of God. Or all the creative hierarchies that work within God that create everything. So what happens is when there are no desires to attract us, when there are no physical sensations to distract us, when we are alone with our thoughts, it seems Then you begin to make things, and everything shows up as a thundering type of quality. Everything is filled with thought, and the strongest thoughts are the thoughts that keep the cosmos going. Things that are to us right now extremely subtle, like the music of the spheres, the music of the spheres that is causing the, co the cosmos continuously be changing and mutating and metamorphizing is present. And that's what it's like when we enter the second heaven. Except that these analogies are very critical. So what we do is unthink our thoughts. We recycle the thought material. But how do you unthink a thought? It's something like memory. When you remember something, you produce a continuity in time. When we're causing something to happen, we're going with it. But then when we move on to something else, that thing we cause to happen is no longer in our attention. It's as, almost as if it doesn't exist anymore. But the reality of all the things that have been is re-experienced or brought into a total experience of remembering it. But the remembering is not a recall. It's like going back to a thought that you thought before and you have the same thought and it has more meaning. So when you rethink, 
you can say, ah, that's what I was intending all along. And when you have that experience of rethinking and seeing what the original intent was and seeing what actually came out from your thought, that is how you complete the thought, that is how you neutralize it, and that is how it is uh, set loose to go back to the thought world. Not only do we rethink our thoughts, at this point, we are part of the spirit. We are part of the creation. And we are like nature forces. And we're very important nature forces. As we said several times, we are the only self-conscious beings in this outer world. And that being the case, it means that our thinking is a special kind of thinking that no other beings can do. Therefore, we become the people who see the outside. And we remember what that's like. And when the cosmos is being created, we become a big part of that. And whether you, it's a funny sensation, but we're like thoughts thinking thoughts. And we are thinking the universe into existence. There are a lot of other beings that are more powerful than us, but we have a very important part of what goes on. And the things that we think into existence when we are purely minds, purely creative minds, purely creative minds of God, are the things that are going to be part of our environment in the future. We're starting to build already what our next life is going to be. So never at any time, even though we're unwinding, never are we useless to the cosmos. We all have things that we do. Now, the thing of it is that we are very slow thinkers. Like, even though I have a lot of experience at it, to put together a, a, the notes for one talk like this can take as much as 12 hours. Sometimes it's usually between eight and ten hours for every hour in the talk and the notes together condensing the thought so that it is usable as notes in the talk. But that's nothing. There are some things that to go from one step to the next step in thought has taken me fifteen or twenty years. We're very, very slow thinkers. And these are just thoughts of recognizing the truths of things. These are not concentrations like where you try to imagine something and form an image in your consciousness and hold it until it can become a reality in the physical world. That takes a long time. It can be measured in terms of hundreds of years. This is why it takes such a long, long time to come back to birth. It is because we are not good at being concentrated and sustained thinkers. The more we practice the spiritual exercises so that we can hold the thought so clearly that others can see it, and that we can make it manifest, like we're making a statue or something like that, the more we practice that, the sooner we will be able to come back to birth in our life. The whole process can be accelerated by our ability to think. The better we think, the more true we think, the faster we think, the more we can participate in the universe. If you think about it, it is our primary service. The minerals give the form, the plants give the life, the animals give the desire to the world. We give thought. And the more thoughtful we can be, and the better our thought is, the more we are doing the best kind of service of all. Now I've got to cut a lot of material out of here. We're 
just about finished. And this is all done. When all of our thoughts have been rethought, we then enter into our divine self. We enter into what Paul called third heaven. We enter the state where we recognize who the thinker is. That is the self. That is the third spirit. And when we enter into that, we do see the glory that Paul saw. He says there's one glory to his, the sun and another glory to the moon. Everything has its spiritual glory. But most of those things are so deep, and so profound, and so ineffable that they are things of the spirit. And they are not things of the phenomenal light cycle. The spirit itself knows how long it has to be in the purely spiritual realms so it can be restored and so it can be filled with the grand creative idea of the whole business. It would be unwise for someone like me who talk that much about the ways of the spirit and then the spirit itself knows which way things are to be. So that's about as far as we'll go this morning. It's going to be too far and too long. And we'll close with the student prayer. Dear God, increase our love for thee. Sorry, it got a little long there. <laughs> yeah, but I got two more minutes.